good morning everybody and uh, let us start uh, with today's uh, round table discussion uh, my name is uh, khalid taimur and i am the executive director for the pakistan research center for community with shared future this pakistan research center for community with shared future was uh, established uh, uh, with the joint collaboration of uh, china communication university the center was established on 20th october 2020 and uh, the center is now working not only with uh, chinese universities but also the center is working in almost uh, 23 plus countries uh, around the world and uh, in pakistan we have our presence in pakistan's biggest university which is the punjab university in uh, uh, lahore and uh, this is our first event jointly being organized with uh, ikra university so let me tell our guests from uh, china that ikra university is one of the most prestigious universities they have their campuses in uh, karachi peshawar and in islamabad so right now we are sitting uh, in islamabad campus and we are uh, mm, uh, 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 with our colleagues uh, from the university uh, they have already introduced uh, themselves Uh, so uh, let me formally start today's session uh, the topic for today is understanding china's global development initiative which is known as gdis and foreign policy under president xi jinping uh, as we know that uh, during the 76th session uh, of un general assembly in 2021 september uh, president xi jinping announced the launch of the global development initiatives as known as uh, gdis he proposed the gdis uh, by realizing the impact of covid-19 and development needs of the less developed countries uh, president xi jinping tagged the goals of gdis with the sustainable development goals of the united nation uh, and uh, they have uh, china has set a goal for 2030 to achieve uh, uh, through uh, the gdis so uh we will be making a report of this conference so we have students over here with us also and after the formal speeches we will uh, take questions from uh, the students also and uh, uh, since we have two senior people from the china communication university with us online so we would also request them to answer that so before uh, so now i would uh, formally start the session and i would invite uh, uh, ms mariam raza she is the deputy director of the pakistan research center for community with shared future and our topic is significance of the belt and road initiative and regional connectivity uh, greetings and assalamu alaikum everyone uh, i am mariam raza deputy director at pakistan research center for community with shared future uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us here and thank you so much for your presence uh, we are talking about today uh, on a on different aspect but one of the main aspect which i would like to highlight is about belt and road initiative and how this uh, concept and this extended pillar of this concept can help to enhance the regional connectivity so starting i would uh, i would give bit of a period about the historical perspective of china and pakistan relationship but i would more focus on the major new themes that have uh, that have been introduced uh, by president xi jinping under bri and cpac so uh, we all are aware that uh, in, in may 1951 the relationship of pakistan and china uh, they were started and then the attachment of this friendship uh, goes beyond the uh, economic aspect and now this friendship has uh, turned into all weather strategic partnership uh, we are uh, in 2022 we uh, are celebrating 71st anniversary but the relationship of both countries like china and pakistan they are based on some uh, major principles uh, number one is equality then respect of each other sovereignty uh, then independence and also mutual trust and uh, mutual assistance but here i would like to uh, highlight the major uh, dimensions of uh, the relationship uh, that we have with china so uh, number one is obviously a uh, belt and road initiative and cpac and second is the regional connectivity through the co concept of community with shared future Uh, now when we are talking about bri we all know that it's not just uh, an infrastructure project but all, uh, now it has gone beyond its boundary and now there are a lot of um, new developments that uh, that have been going on uh, within this uh, with uh, in this project and uh, i would say that re through regional connectivity there are major two uh, uh, 
aspect which we uh, which we want to uh, understand which we uh, which we which are really important for for in today's uh, in today's world because there are a lot of social economic transformation going on so uh, obviously number one is bri and then the, there is shanghai cooperation organization so both of these uh, both of these organization and both of these projects are very important when it comes to uh, the two, two major concept number one is community which shape future for mankind which is an umbrella approach and the second is dialogue among civilization now community which shape future is a concept which was uh, proposed by president xi jinping in 2015 that was not, not just for economic development or common prosperity but also it was a new concept to uh, counter or to tell the uh, common challenges like non traditional security challenges climate change and other uh, challenges of uh, similar nature then the second important uh, paradigm was dialogue among civilization that now in this world in this 21st century when there are so many challenges when there are so many issues of uh, uh, common issues so there are a lot of uh, projects and a lot of themes uh, which uh, have been introduced by china and other countries like uh, as i've mentioned like dialogue of civilization community we share future so now countries are moving towards a uh, dialogue of civilization from class of clash of civilizations so uh, obviously there are two major um, pillars of this that is inter civilization connectivity and intercultural harmony because to know uh, to know about country structure and their socio economic dynamics is very important to uh, realize about their their people their culture their their civilization and their uh, economic structure th that they have then obviously this concept is uh, to modernize economies and open borders because when countries are uh, when countries change their socio economic structure they are typically forced to change their culture as well they are more they try to be more inclusive they are try to be more accountable they are more open towards their their uh, internal structure obviously to enhance uh, region connectivity and to have such um, uh, such key uh, you know some projects or key aspect that they which enable them to cooperate with other states so these are the most two important project uh, two important ideas but here uh, obviously they will drive towards the concept of uh, regionalism or regionalization which is also uh, a very impo important aspect to which uh, which has been bringing a profound transformation in this uh, in this time period so this uh, this uh, concept has emerged as a significant trend in international affairs or international relations uh, on the other side we have seen that there are a lot of various areas which uh, you know there is still a need of a lot of con uh, connectivity which are obviously transport communication information sharing a move towards a cohesive global uh, community to counter common threats so along with all the uh, explicit benefits these uh, processes br bring for example community we share future dialogue of civilization bri and other extent and pillars of it there are a lot of uh, uh, new paradigm shift within the institutional framework so because there are there are two uh, major uh, uh, i would say that uh, you know there are two major things one is community to build a community and then to move towards a share, towards a shared uh, future so when uh, a con when countries are making alliances basically there are two um, ideas one is for the balance of power and the second is a balance of uh, their uh, you know to uh, counter their their offensive uh, coming from other country offense coming from other country so when there is a balance of power obviously countries uh, build relations and they make alliances such alliances that would uh, benefit them in a longer term and when obviously there is a counter of a balance of uh, uh, power uh, with relevance to counter offensive strategies so obviously they try to enhance their uh, power through uh, through different uh, uh, to different coercive means so uh, but in this today's uh, time period there are a lot of uh, development going on towards uh, with relevance to regional connectivity uh, among the regions and also china, obviously china is playing a major role in this aspect so obviously now there's it is very important to highlight that how these common institutions and these these vision can help to uh, enhance connectivity among countries and obviously bri and other such bri cpac and all other such projects can really help in uh, to curtail uh, common challenges and to uh, move towards a uh, 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 to create a, a community with shared future so this is this was all for my side thank you so much uh, thank you very much uh, now ab main apne students ko ye bataun ke 
हमारी जो नेक्स्ट स्पीकर हैं चाइना से आ, उनका नाम है मिस सॉन्ग शी बेसिकली वर्क्स इन पाकिस्तान रिसर्च सेंटर ऑफ स्कूल ऑफ इंटरनेशनल स्टडीज उर्दू में मैं इसलिए बात कर रहा हूँ कि आप लोगों को ये पता हो कि इनको बहुत अच्छी उर्दू बोलनी भी आती है एंड ये उर्दू चाइना कम्युनिकेशन यूनिवर्सिटी में उर्दू पढ़ाती भी रही हैं तो अब आ, इनका टॉपिक है अंडरस्टैंडिंग चाइनाज ग्लोबल डेवलपमेंट इनिशिएटिव जी डी आई एस प्रोस्पेक्टिव एंड अपॉर्चुनिटीज फॉर पाकिस्तान तो अब मैं मैं सॉन्ग से रिक्वेस्ट करूँगा कि पहले तो स्टूडेंट से उर्दू में कुछ बातचीत कर लें एंड फिर उसके बाद अपनी प्रेजेंटेशन भी दें मिस सॉन्ग अच्छा 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 अस्सलाम वालेकुम दोस्तों आ, मैं बहुत खुश हूँ कि आज ये मौका मिला कि तमाम रिसर्चर्स और प्रोफेसर के सामने और दोस्तों तलब इलमों के सामने जीडीआई के पाले में एक तकलीफ दूंगी um, Yes, uh, although I'm lecturing Urdu, but I would like to deliver my speech today in English, and my speech today will uh, primarily deal with the Global Development Initiative proposed by President Xi Jinping and the prospects and opportunities for Pakistan. Okay, <clears throat> so. President Xi Jinping on September 21, 2021, at the United Nations General Assembly, proposed a global development initiative in steering global development toward a new stage of balanced, coordinated, and inclusive growth. It focused on practical cooperation in nine、uh, in eight key areas. By building a global partnership and global community of development, GDI provides Chinese wisdom and Chinese solutions for the implementation of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And as we all know, since the establishing diplomatic ties in 1951, China and Pakistan have stood together in rain or shine and built an exceptional time-tested all-weather friendship. CPAC, as the flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative, has strengthened the connectivity between the two countries and contributes to Pakistan's economic development. It proves that how a community of shared destiny can benefit both countries and people. And we know development is the eternal pursuit of human society. It holds the keys to people's well-being. And highlighting peace and development, GDI aims to revitalize the economy and pursue more robust, greener, and more balanced global development. And China and Pakistan are both developing countries. The National Security Policy 2022 to 2026, released by Pakistan at the beginning of this year, also highlights the signal that development promotes security. The policy states to place economic security as a core element of national security and to confront challenges in population, health, climate, water resources, food security, gender equality, and more. And since the inception, the GDI has received warm response from the international community. And China, in January this year, launched a group of friends of the GDI, which was joined by Pakistan and more than 50 other countries. It shows that the GDI has effectively united the international community and plays an important role in carrying out practical cooperation in various fields. And understanding current macro settings, principles, and philosophy of the GDI, my speech today attempts to analyze the prospects and opportunities of Pakistan, and to put forward suggestions on promoting the cooperation and development of the two countries and the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Growth at Large. And first, I would like to talk about the current macro setting of the GDI. Last month. The first edition of the Global Development Report was launched, in which the change of global landscape, COVID-19 pandemic, digital revolution, and green transformation are identified as the four fundamental variables in our time. So, first, the global economic pattern is changing dramatically. On the one hand, emerging market,、uh, emerging market countries 
and developing countries are raising faster than ever before. The GDP share of the both of the both two mentioned countries in the global economy has increased to nearly 60% in 2020. Uh, the world's economic center of gravity has been shifting from the north to the developing south. On the other hand, developed countries still maintain a leading position in major international economic fields, and their per capita GDP is about 48,000 US dollars, which is nine times that of developing economics. Second, the pandemic has aggregated the imbalance of development. The COVID-19 pandemic not only threatened people's health and safety, but also put greater pressure on the already weak and vulnerable global economy. The populations at the bottom of global income contribution, small and medium enterprises, and the economics of developing countries have become the most vulnerable and deeply affected by the pandemic, further exacerbating the problem of global inequality. Third, digital transformation is building a new ecology of digital economy. The technological revolution has greatly promoted productivity, and nowadays the digital economy has become the most important feature of the fourth industrial revolution. Digital technology has been integrated and applied in various fields, which not only promotes the transformation of production method, but also people's consumption mindset and behaviors. However, some developing countries, especially the least developed countries, still have little access to digital infrastructure, resulting in the widespread digital divide among regions. And last is that the green transition is an inherent requirement of sustainable development and is related to the future of all mankind. We, we all know that climate change, loss of bi biodiversity and pollution are the three major ecological and environmental crises faced by the Earth today. The ongoing impact of the pandemic on the global economy has weakened the investment of relevant countries in climate change. So under these circumstances, GDI was proposed by China to solve the global issues. So my next part will focus on the principles and philosophy of the GDI. First, development is a priority. The GDI encourages the resolution of outstanding problems and the challenges of governance in the course of development. Second, people-centered philosophy is the core. The GDI strives to ensure that development is for the people and by the people, and that its fruits are shared among the people through improving their livelihood and enhancing their sense of happiness, fulfillment, and security. Third, benefits for all is the inherent requirement. The GDI as a global public good for bridging the development divide and addressing the development deficit is committed to promoting inclusive group development, addressing unbalanced and inadequate development, and making global development more equitable, effectiveness, and inclusive, so that no country and no people will be left behind. And thus, the pursuit of harmony between man and nature is a value orientation. The GDI upholds the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities with a view to strengthening global climate and environmental governance and building a community of shared destiny. So I would like to discuss the path to implement the GDI and the prospects and opportunities possible for Pakistan. In my opinion, no the North and the South need to work in the same direction to forge a united, equal, balanced, and inclusive global development partnership and build a global community of development. In other words, the core is still the North-South cooperation, and South-South cooperation is a useful supplement. So to be more specific, the first aspect I want to discuss is poverty reduction. 
anti-poverty in all its forms is a primary goal of the 2030 agenda. The World Bank has estimated that poverty rate in Pakistan has increased from 4.4% to 5.4% in 2020, and 34% of the Pakistan population was living on just 3.2 US dollars a day income. Industrial backwardness, poor public services, high unemployment, terrorism are all attributes to the situation. So to build a global community of development and work together to reduce poverty, on the other hand, relying on North-South cooperation. Developed countries are expected to increase financial and technical support to developing countries, including Pakistan, such as introducing latest agriculture technology to increase yield and added value, sending agriculture experts for technical assistance when the country encounters a large-scale agriculture disaster, improves the production and living conditions of the poverty-stricken population, and establish compulsory education and med medical system through investment in infrastructure and public services. On the other hand, it is also crucial for Pakistan to strengthen experience exchanges and knowledge sharing with other developing countries to explore a path suitable for its national conditions. Pakistan could learn lessons from the success story of China in alleviating poverty. Meanwhile, China should bring the advantage of the CPAC into full play so that the fruits of development will be able to benefit more local impoverished people. And the second aspect uh, is in terms of promoting industrialization in developing countries. According to Pakistan Economic Survey 2020 to 2021, in financial year 2021, services sectors accounts for about 62% of GDP, while the agricultural and industrial sector each account for about 19%. The rough economic structure seems to have a high proportion of the services sector, showing a consumption-driven post-industrialization state. However, our agriculture sector is indispensable to Pakistan's economic growth, employment generation, and poverty alleviation. Not only does it contribute 19.2% to the GDP, but also provides employment to around 38.5% of the labor force. Uh, besides more than 65 to 70 percent of the population depends on agriculture for its livelihood. So to promote industrialization in developing countries, including Pakistan, first the world should strengthen the cooperation on new industrialization, integrate digital economy and traditional manufacturing. The world should increase technolo technology transform to developing countries. Besides supports, supports developing countries to better integrate into global industrial chains, value chains, and supply chains. Uh, at the same time, Pakistan should seize the opportunity of the current technological revolution, seek new drivers and new ways to promote economic growth and development industrial policy, which is centered on revitalizing the manufacturing industry. Second, promote scenery in industrialization cooperation and their virus mechanism. The role of multilateral development institutions, such as the World Bank and the New Development Bank, should be fully played in providing project financing and other support for the industrialization of developing countries. Besides, Pakistan should seize the opportunity as CPAC has entered its second phase Nine special economic zones will be established in Pakistan, where enterprise from China and other countries could set up their business and manufacturing facilities so as to create more employment opportunities, improve logistics, develop remote areas, and expand experts in Pakistan. So in conclusion, GDI is another public good provided by China for the world, which shows China's commitment as a responsible major country and is an important measure for practicing the concept of a community with a shared future for mankind. It upholds true multilateralism and the spirit of extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits. 
Pakistan is expected to actively participate in cooperation in eight key areas through existing global, regional, and bilateral mechanisms, especially the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, to accelerate domestic economic growth, alleviate poverty, and promote industrialization. Just as Pakistani Foreign Minister uh, Zardadi stated during a virtual high-level meeting of the Group of Friends of GDI this May, Pakistan looks forward to work hand-in-hand hand hand with China and other members of the GDI Group of Friends to promote our common aspiration for a peaceful, prosperous, and shared future for all of the humankind. And that's all of my uh, speech. Bohobo uh, shukliya. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, I would like to request uh, uh, our friend who's sitting over here, uh, Dr. Rijaz Hussain. He is the Associate Professor in the Department of uh, Social Sciences. And uh, he is also uh, associated with Fudan University in China. His topic of his speech is President Xi Jinping, a visionary statement and role model for the other leaders. So, uh, Dr. Rijaz. Thank you very much, Khaled uh, for and of course your institution for providing Ukraine University this opportunity to co-host this event uh, with uh, China's Communication uh, University based in Beijing. As you can see, uh, the title of my talk is President Xi Jinping, a visionary statesman and a role model for other leaders in the world. Right? So since most of us here are uh, from the IR background and hopefully you know the basics, but for Pakistani audience, I would uh, like to you know, uh, focus more a bit on the historical developments in the way China emerged uh, as a country. Okay. Yes. Uh, so it is, uh, it is the context of the Second World War uh, in which in this, this uh, Eastern Front, I would call it, there was warfare going on initially between Japanese and Chinese. Uh, and Chinese uh, were led by two you know, different sections, uh, one of which was led by Chairman Mao. And that actually resulted into the successful culmination of their you know, movement for independence. And then China emerged as a communist country uh, in 1949, right? 1950s and 60s is a period which I would describe as China's consolidation. Uh, culturally, nationally, or ethno-nationally, and to an extent, uh, economically, right? Uh, it is also the period, early 1970s, uh, where China realized, uh, because of its own uh, calculations, that it need to reconnect with the international community and institution led by the USA. And this resulted into the, what we call an IR rapprochement between China and the USA, right? And of course, this was, this was uh, made possible because of Pakistan's uh, role, right? Pakistan played a very important role in the late 1960s till 72 to, to provide an enabling environment in terms of playing a role of a emissary or, or a, uh, uh, a diplomat between these two countries, right? Uh, resulting into the meeting between President Nixon and President, or rather Chairman Mao in 1972, uh, which, which helped China got re-entry into international systems such as the UN or even later on into World Bank and IMF. So before I say something more uh, on, 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 on China, later on focusing on President Xi Jinping's uh, role uh, as a leader, uh, I would like you to, to look at this picture and make a guess uh, that what sort of meaning did you get from this image? Uh, can you describe the, the personality in the picture? And overall, this sort of you know, uh, meaning can you decipher? Right? All right. Let me, the guy in the, in the picture looks like a Chinese, uh, well, the Chinese president who assumed power over there in 19, late 1970s, known as Deng Xiaoping. And the guy in the front who is holding a camera is a Western tourist, right? Who is, who is in somewhere in Shanghai uh, taking photos, right? So to my analysis of this picture is that this reflects on China's, you know, getting open to the rest of the world. And it's actually uh, was realized under a policy introduced by President, then President uh, Deng Xiaoping in 1978, introduced as reform and opening up, right? 
And if you want to read more on reform in Rupnagar, because that, that in my view is the, uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the background, is the institutional and policy background, which enable the modern China, China of the con contemporary period, the last of the last 15 years, to lead the world in, in, in all respects, right? Uh, and, and the guy uh, that you can see in that picture, the mini one, is a, is a Harvard graduate Chinese economist based at Tsinghua University in China. Tsinghua and Peking are the leading universities in China. And he, among other, wrote this book, uh, which uh, stipulates, you know, the policy decision making led by uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, with implication for Chinese and global economies in the following decade. For example, if you look at this image before 1972, um, right, uh, there was always zero trade between China and the USA. So the, the bilateral trade started kicking up late 1970s as a result of this policy of reform and opening up. And China's and uh, American, you know, bilateral exchange actually is going into millions of US dollars. For example, if you look at the figure uh, from the Chinese side, which is in red, in uh, around 1989 uh, or 1990, it's crossing around 6,000 US million dollars, which is, which is quite significant if you look at China's trade with Western uh, countries in the, in the previous or preceding decades. Similarly, uh, as a result, as a fallout of this policy of reforming opening up, if you look at the data uh, from, from the sources, Chinese sources in particular that are mentioned uh, at the bottom of this image, China's share in the global trade is, is incrementally is going up, right? And this will be further explained in a while. So before I further you know, uh, analyze China's growing uh, position in international politics and commerce with the, with the focus you know, more on President Xi Jinping in a while, let me here, uh, you know, uh, propose certain factors which, in my view, enable China in the last uh, 30 years to emerge as a powerful economic actor. Uh, I believe since 2010, it is the leading, second leading economy in the world. The first biggest dominant factor, in my view, is a very efficient uh, and coherent role of the, of the China's Communist Party, usually known as CPC. Uh, through which, for example, President Deng Xiaoping in late 1970s introduced this policy reform and up. And the number two is the consistency in their economic and social policies, which is, which is quite um, uh, a, a takeaway for most of the developing countries or the countries in the South. Lastly is the role of the leadership within the Communist Party of China, uh, whereby the focus remain on uplifting, for example, poverty, uh, overall promoting social economic development in all, in all sections or constituencies within the country. Now, since my topic is mostly on President Xi Jinping, uh, that is his profile, I mean, uh, in terms of his personality, he is currently uh, assuming very three powerful positions uh, uh, in Chinese uh, government uh, that I'll, I'll let you know in a while, but before uh, I do that, here is a brief profile of President Xi Jinping. He was born in Beijing in 1953. Um, uh, he had a schooling from the city. Uh, he, his family was, was already having a very um, uh, major role within the, the, the CPC. And he, as a, as a student, uh, joined the party. I think he was, he was hardly 15 in 1974 uh, in Shanxi province of the country. And very importantly, he was enrolled at a very young age uh, at Tsinghua University in China, which is now the leading, top leading university in, in China and also the world. Which means that he, he had a lot of interaction with people from other parts of the country to know, for example, the contemporary uh, challenges that China was facing in the 1970s, right? Even he, he, he got closer to the then president in terms of you know, getting into the policies that he introduced. Um, later on, he had further training, as you probably may know, that in China, it's a different political system. It's a different political party system. Uh, and when you are a member of the party, you've been put through different tasks, right? For example, to work as a layman, as a layperson, maybe as a, as a, as a, as a, as a farmer, in different parts of the country uh, that, that is passed with the training. So he had a lot of trainings in, for example, in Zhejiang and in, in Hebei uh, in the 1980s. And uh, in the 1990s is the crucial period when he had further you know, uh, progression in terms of getting to the, to the top echelons uh, of the Communist Party of China. For example, he joined um, uh, the, uh, the Central uh, Committee of the, of the Standing Committee of the CPC in 2007. And within the next three or four years, he assumed three powerful positions rather prominent position within the Communist Party of China and within the country. And the first one is that he became the general secretary of the CPC in 2012, which is the powerful slot within the party and within the country. And he is also uh, the chairman of the C CMC, the Central Military Commission of China, 
since 2013, uh, 2012, and he is president of China in 2013. Now, let me hear, based essentially on uh, this uh, text, which I think is produced in different volumes uh, for the last five or six years. I actually was gifted this book when I was in China uh, in 2015 at a conference in Peking University. Uh, so mostly I, 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 I read this book, which comprises uh, policy speeches of President Xi Jinping and also his vision uh, for China and, and the global community. Uh, so in my view, there are a lot of um, indicators through which we can map, you know, his personality or overall his aura for the Chinese and the regional uh, leaders and, and populations. But in my view, the, these are three to five uh, indicators through which we can assess uh, that he is, he, is a, he is a very solid statesman uh, and very regional leader. One of them is that he traditionally went on with, uh, with, the, with the Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, tradition to consolidate the existing gains, existing gains in terms of economic development, existing gains uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, continuing with the, with the policies that they've already adopted. Uh, and very importantly, uh, individually, he emphasized in, in this modern uh, the context of the 21st century that China now onward needs to further uh, reform and open up. So in other words, in my view, he went on with the Deschamps policy of reform uh, and opening up, and uh, with, of course, with a lot of initiatives that he deduced uh, uh, as a leader. And you can see those uh, in this list. For example, with the assumption of the, the, of the presidentship of the country in 2013, um, uh, he very uh, confidently introduced a very meta uh, or mega project uh, known as One Belt or One Road, or in other words, the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The same year, which is very, very important. Of which, by the way, uh, there are six corridors, uh, economic corridors, which are proposed for global economic uh, connectivity, of which China-Pakistan economic corridor, commonly known as CPEC, is, is, is a part. Uh, similarly, um, though the BRICS as a platform was already uh, there since 2006 and some say 2009 when it held its first session, uh, it was actually a project of China to an extent uh, with Russian uh, uh, consultations. So he further in uh, the, the second decade of this uh, century consolidated uh, the institutional uh, and uh, uh, structural gains uh, which already achieved through the BRICS. And uh, thirdly, uh, it, is, it was his initiative to actually you know, think about an institution, right? I'm not saying that it, this, this institution, the AIIB, uh, was launched to counter, for example, World Bank or, or IMF. But nonetheless, uh, that was a Chinese, you know, uh, vision uh, to provide uh, economic assistance, right, to uh, countries in the South for their respective socioeconomic development. And fourthly, um, it was also uh, his visionary leadership in terms of expansion of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization um, that, you know, was, was actually uh, initially uh, had, had members from, you know, countries from South, Central Asia. Uh, with Russia and China as, as top uh, leaders. But 2016-17 onward, India and Pakistan, the very crucial countries from this region, and, and both of these countries are neighbors to China. Uh, they're also members now of this organization. And there are a lot of countries such as Iran, which are observer uh, to this organization. Hopefully, maybe Afghanistan, maybe will be getting a membership in coming years. And uh, another initiative that is uh, a, a reflection of his visionary leadership is known as Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, usually known as RCEP. Uh, it was signed in 20, it was, a, it was an idea floated five or six years ago. It was signed in 2020. And I believe based on my uh, online reading, I believe it is going to get enforced probably in, in, in this year or maybe early, early next year. Then there are other uh, initiatives as well. For example, uh, I was in Shanghai, by the way, in 2018 when I, even, I actually, you know, took pictures of, of different um, uh, uh, signboards or, or, or projections uh, uh, in, in terms of highlighting China's international import expo, which is, which is a crucial uh, institution, by the way, because Chinese leadership um, were somehow uh, concerned with the, with, with the reservations or whatever we call it from the Western world as China's is, is everywhere in the world in terms of its exports, right, or products, right, and uh, and Chinese market overall is not that open to uh, products from or exports from other countries. So encourage imports, right, or encourage um, uh, uh, products from other countries, such as, for example, USA or European Union or ASEAN or even Pakistan, 
the Chinese government, led by Xi Jinping, introduced this expo, which is, in my view now, has developed itself in the last three or four years as a proper institution, uh, whereby every country, every country uh, and their companies, they have the right, uh, they have the opportunity to share their experiences and, uh, and then promote their uh, exports. Then uh, for the last two years, you know that we, we are engulfed with COVID-19. And um, uh, in my view, China actually played a very important and perhaps a uh, partner role with the rest of the leaders uh, and companies in terms of, you know, uh, winning uh, its patents, right, from, from, for example, being approved by the WHO in terms of, you know, getting the licenses to produce uh, Corona or COVID vaccine, right? In, in Pakistan, you know, all pretty that they are for them, the Sinovac and all sort of uh, uh, vaccines from China already there, and they're quite effective. Then in terms of the um, military modernization, which is crucial part for any country's um, uh, global um, aura or even global projection or even uh, to, to an extent acceptability uh, is military modernization in terms of enhancing uh, and putting more R&D in terms of uh, weapon systems. So Chinese um, military, which is largest, you know, in terms of its numbers and perhaps also in terms of the funds that it, it is getting from the government. Is, is in the path to uh, further uh, get further modernized. And lastly, uh, is the, among others, by the way, but lastly, in my view, because of the, of the, of the time constraints, is the Global Development Initiative that President Xi Jinping introduced, as Khaled uh, and other speakers have already uh, discussed in 2021, which is which is very important um, uh, uh, initiative in terms of, on the one hand, projecting on major issues the world is facing, such as climate crisis, uh, chronic hunger, diseases, uh, even 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 abject poverty, and very importantly, to share Chinese experiences in that regard. Right here, let me here cite one big uh, uh, development or even experience that China actually has effectuated in the last 30 years. And and I believe every serious uh, scholar on China or economists, they actually they actually you know uh, agreed empirically to this fact, which is that China has uplifted more than 700 million people out of object poverty, right? Uh, in the last 30 years. And that is and that is unprecedented in world history, right? And I believe the credit goes to uh, Chairman, uh, uh, President Mao, uh, uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and uh, being the Secretary General of the party, being the president of the country, and also a very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, wise um, uh, role that he is playing within uh, China's uh, uh, overall policy. Uh, mechanism. So lastly, before I wind up, let me here uh, uh, provide you some economic figures so that you can assess that because of his leadership, right, uh, in an important role that he is playing uh, within the country, China is on a, on a very gradual path of uh, realizing economic uh, uh, goals. And, and, and that is amid this, this pandemic, Corona pandemic, right? And this is a figure from Global Times, which, is, which could be cross-verified that China, despite the COVID, uh, you know, implications, for example, on um, uh, global supply chains or even on, in, you know, industrial products or potential, uh, it, 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 it actually even crossed the, the, the earlier projection of the government uh, to, to, to get 8.1% of the GDP target uh, in 2021, right? And uh, not only this, uh, despite, for example, the trade war, uh, uh, I would say, uh, context, the mini context of the last three or four years, initiated by Donald Trump, the then US president, China, the US trade um, is still intact, right? And for, for right reason, because it, it helps, you know, people from, from, from both countries and also with the trickle down effects for regional economies such as even Pakistan. So it also went up on, on a year to year basis. Uh, for example, in 2021, the bilateral trade volume stood at 755 billion US dollars, right? And very importantly, uh, this is a figure that I got from Global Times uh, two days ago, is that even within this year, 2022, if we look at uh, China's economic uh, interaction or trade ties with all the important stakeholders, right? For example, European Union, uh, the US, ASEAN, and BRICS, it actually is on the rise, right? For example, in the H1 stand for first half one, right? First half. So in the first half of 2021, I mean, less a lot, if just, just a year ago, if you look at uh, the bilateral trade between China and the European Union, the numbers stood at, uh, in terms of percentage, at 13.7%, right? So this year, in the first half of 2022, six months of this year, 
it actually is two you know, percentile up compared to the previous year. Similarly with ASEAN, it stored at 14.7 uh, uh, in, in, in this year and, and a minor you know, decline compared to the last year. With, with the BRIC countries, it actually is on the rise and with Russia, it's, it's also on, on the rise. So that, this, is, this is a good data uh, for, for economists, uh, even for political economists to actually you know, think more meaningfully that China is under President Xi Jinping, uh, is continuing with further uh, you know, opening up uh, and making reforms where required to, um, to progress, uh, to provide you know, uh, economic developmental goals to their audiences and also you know, sharing their experiences with the rest of the world through forums such as the, the Belt and Road and even through the DDI. And uh, before I mind up, um, for example, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the next five to 10 years, if you look at the, the Economist uh, Intelligence Unit's uh, analysis, it uh, empirically suggests that China would, would surpass the leading economy, the current one is the USA, in, in early 30s, right? Some, some studies argue that within the next two years, China would be the, the leading economy of the world, right? But in any way, uh, within the next 10 to 15 years, China is going to be the leading economy of the world, which would, of course would be a great sign for um, for 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 the uh, for, for for actually uh, realizing uh, their objective under the leadership of President Xi Jinping. So, in my view, uh, lastly, there are there are certain lessons uh, and or takeaways for leaders in uh, especially in the South, like countries such as India, Pakistan, or even Nigeria, or even Latin American countries. There are there are. I think this could be further extended, but in my view, one of the one of the major lessons that we, we, we learn from Chinese story of development and uh, particularly under President Xi Jinping is to to have political stability. Right, without political stability, you cannot have a, a policy uh, consistency. Right, especially in economic terms. And number two is that Chinese leaders, right, since Chair Chairman Mao till you know President Xi Jinping. They are they are working on a on a national developmental policy in terms of providing economic relief to their people, right? In other words, their their development is pro people, right? And I just cited this example of seven hundred million, seven hundred million, right? If you put in Urdu, both pretty the lot, but be right. Uh, number two, uh, number three is within their foreign policy, China is, in my view, this is my term by the way, right? China actually. For the last many decades, I, I would say for the last 70, 60, the war with India in 62, China actually is buying peace. What does it mean? It means China is, 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 is non-confrontational in its foreign policy, right? Um, we may say that China has had have, have territorial disputes with, with some countries, right? especially India, and they have skirmishes recently in Ladakh. Even in 2017, they have, they have a spat um, in uh, Dockland, but nonetheless, uh, these two countries, right, and other countries with, with China has some, some, some disputes, uh, they, they, they mark restraint, right? And this actually is a, a reflection of, of Chinese policies under Xi Jinping, that they, they're not going to militarily fight with any country because that would be a wastage on their economic and other resources, right? Even, even a morning to opportunity cost, right? This is, this is the key lesson for, for countries, especially in, in Africa and Asia and even in Latin America. And lastly, uh, through BRI, right, there, there could be one lesson that I can draw is uh, that it provides us with uh, two catch words and catch uh, uh, in terms of policy uh, making in our country is to, to realize connectivity or commercial connectivity through global and regional cooperation, especially economic cooperation. Right? So that is um, from my side and China, because I live in China for, for, I mean, for, for a number of years, I work in China as well. Um, it is our neighbor, you know, a, a great civilization, great country, and even great in terms of, you know, sharing new trends, right? So that, I actually knew this place very well, um, but what I realized is that in the last couple of years, the Chinese government, especially the, 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 uh, the municipal or, or mayorship in Shanghai, they actually are working, for example, on this project of, uh, of getting, you know, electricity from this, uh, this solar, you know, source, but putting the plates within within the sea, right? That that to me was 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 something new, right? So thank you very much. And if there are questions, if there are concerns, that we can take later on.
thank you very much. Now we'll again go back to Beijing, uh, where we, uh, we have uh, uh, with us uh, Miss uh, Sean Dan. Uh, and let me also introduce her that she's from the Regional Studies Center in the School of International Studies at China Communication University. And uh, she speaks Pashto very well. So we have a lot of people over here who are Pashto speaking. So uh, you can talk to them in Pashto. You can communicate them in Pashto. Uh, she has learned her Pashto in Afghanistan. And uh, then you can start off with your speech. Yes, please. Okay, hi. Salaam alaikum. Good afternoon. It's my honor and pleasure to address in this roundtable discussion. My speech is on discussing President Xi Jinping's grand proposal, building a community with shared future and dialogue of civilizations. So we're not alone on the great way and the whole world is one family. Following the trend of peace development and win-win cooperation, President Xi Jinping put forward the important idea of building a community with a shared future for mankind, which embodies China's worldview in the new era and vision of fair and equitable global order. A community with a shared future is the guiding principle of China's international relations and embodiment of China's foreign policy goals. It is China's answer to the call of the time for a world beset by numerous challenges and risks like terrorism, slow growth, climatic change, protectionism, and anti-globalization. It has contributed Chinese wisdom and Chinese solutions. And the above concept is rooted in Chinese civilization. Caring and sharing are in the DNA of Chinese culture. As an ancient saying goes, take care of yourself well when you are poor. Share the benefits with the world when you become better off. It amply exhibits the spirit. And President Xi Jinping proposed to build such a community and vigorously advocated exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations. China recognized that diversity is inherent in civilizations of the world. No civilization is more superior than others as each civilization has its profound heritage and unique charm. Diversity of human civilizations not only defines our world, but also drives the progress of mankind. As he put it, there should be dialogue among civilizations, not exclusion, to exchange, not to supplant. The history of mankind is a magnificent picture of the exchanges, mutual learning and integration of different civilizations. He has repeatedly expressed the view that civilizations are colorful due to exchanges and civilizations are enriched by mutual learning. And as a new development concept, it has unique connotation. And the core of which is building a world of lasting peace, universal security, common prosperity, openness, inclusiveness, clearness, and beauty. In short, the significance of exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations in promoting building, uh, uh, in, in promoting building of such a community is mainly reflected in the following three aspects. So first, it can provide new inspiration for all countries to achieve better development, developments. And second, it can lay a solid foundation for countries to carry out practical collaboration. And third, it can unite the strength of all parties to improve global governance. And over the past few years, China has actively taken the initiative and make a continuous contributions to deepen exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations. The initiative is a vivid manifestation of the spirit of shared benefits with the world when you are better off in the realm of international corporations. And in particular, President Xi Jinping clearly proposed to build the Belt and Road into a road of civilization and regarded as a platform for realizing the goal of building a community with a shared future. And there is a long history of the cultural exchanges between China and Pakistan. With the construction of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, public opinion plays an important role in promoting cultural exchanges between the two countries. During the constructions of the Belt and Road, China is willing to share its experience in reform and opening up, industrialization and poverty alleviation. 
we take the initiative as an important method to promote people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges, to deepen cultural cooperation, academic and ideological exchanges, so that people can view each other's differences more objectively and understand others' particularities. And exchanges between universities and think tanks, non-governmental diplomacy, and interactions between the mainstream media of the two countries have fruitful achievements. And the people-to-people -people bond less in the mutual understanding and respect of cultures. So in recent years, the cultural, educational, and artistic exchanges activities between China and Pakistan have been held one after another, which are bridges between China's, uh, which are bridges between people's hearts. China and Pakistan lack a common cultural cognition and foundation. So, and still there is a large gap in the demand for cultural and civilization exchanges. It is necessary to find common grounds of exchanges for mutual understanding and recognition in culture and building strong political and cultural mutual trust to get rid of these harmonious factors. And we better use media platform to carry out a variety of online and offline cultural exchanges activities, seek commonalities in differences, take advantages of various activities like the Cultural Week, Year of Exchanges. Through cultural exchanges, equality and mutual trust promote stability and harmony. Promote future-oriented and youth-targeted activities, enhance understanding, deepen friendship, and build a platform for youth to pursue peace and progress. With the joint support of all sectors of society in the countries along the Belt Road, young people hand in hand and forge ahead. Under the framework of the national community to promote international political and economic and trade cooperation, it is of great significance to actively carry out exchanges and performances, exhibitions, and other cultural, artistic, and literary activities. In the world, the diversity of civilizations in Asia is the most prominent. Over the past thousands of years, many unique and colorful civilizations have been nurtured in the Yellow and Yangtze River basins, the Indus and Ganges River basins, the Euphrates and the Tigris River basins, and South Asia. Nowadays, the people of, of, of all countries in Asia are constantly absorbing nourishment from the long-lasting civilizations, and the contemporary value of civilization is manifested in economic and social development. So build people-to-people -people bonds, make the Belt and Road run steadily and far, adhering to the spirit of Silk Road, peaceful cooperation, openness and inclusiveness, mutual learning, mutual benefit, and a win-win result. In the process of realizing the common development of all countries, exchanges and mutual learning among civilizations will surely play an irreplaceable and important role, becoming a shock, a shock absorber to reduce misunderstanding and friction and becoming an adhesive to enhance pragmatic collaboration, thus lay a more solid foundation for building a community with a shared future for Asia and for mankind. Thank you so much for my speech. Thank you for listening. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We'll come back again to you for question and answer session. Uh, now we'll go over to the last speaker of today's uh, uh, roundtable conference. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Mohammad Saad. He has done his PhD from Wuhan University in China, and he's the assistant professor of the social in the social sciences department in the Ikra University. Uh, the topic of his speech is relevance of China's uh, global development index uh, in attaining UN sustainable development goals. So over to Dr. Saad. Song Lao Shu, Shantan Lao Shu, respected teachers, colleagues, executive director of the Pakistan Research Center. And my dear students, Assalamu alaikum and thank you for coming here. It's my honor and great privilege to present the topic relevance and overlap of China's GDI 
in attaining the United Nations SDGs. Since we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has slowed down global development, both at macro, micro, formal and informal level, uh, we are still uh, lagging behind the UN strategic developmental goals. Since 2015 to 2020, we were, the world was, the world community was actually thinking, brainstorming uh, in a fashion that we, we have still much time left. But as soon as the pandemic uh, hit the world and everything was closed, and in then in 2021, uh, the world, when uh, came back, opened up, uh, we saw that we have entered the decade for action, that the time is, uh, uh, the clock is ticking and, and there is very less time left behind. So it was in that time that President Xi Jinping in September uh, 2021, in the 76th session, uh, of the United Nations General Assembly proposed his uh, great vision of the GDI, the Global Development Initiative, which actually is uh, not uh, parallel to the SDGs, but instead it is a congruent idea. It, it, it favors uh, the promotion and achieving of the uh, SDGs uh, as quickly as possible. So uh, in this slide, I'll be, yeah, in this slide, I'll be sharing with you uh, the main uh, goals of the SDG and the Global Developmental Initiative. Uh, if you look at the green shaded objectives, poverty reduction, food security, financing for development, industrialization, and climate change and green development. And if you look at the other side of the table, you will see that the GDI goals, the first GDI goals, the first five GDI goals, and the first five sustainable developmental goals, they are all congruent. The number six, seven, and eight goal in the GDI is connectivity, the response to COVID-19, which is actually uh, the provision of uh, vaccinations, ventilators, and training. And the eighth one is uh, promoting digital economy um, in the whole world, especially in the Asia Pacific, South Asia, and Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. Now, six, seven, and eight, these are the goals that President Xi Jinping's GDI has uh, for the first time um, included uh, in their uh, grand strategic vision uh, in accordance with the time and situation. Uh, if you look at the yellow shaded goals uh, on the sustainable developmental side, these are the goals that uh, we have been hearing of, but we have uh, seen very little development upon them. Uh, in his address, in his uh, opening speech at the BAO Forum for Asia Annual Conference in 2022, which was actually held uh, through a video link on Apple 21, 2022, President Xi Jinping, he uh, propagated the spirit of uh, Chinese GDI. He said, we have to work together to promote recovery and a sustainable shared future. The focus is sustainable and shared. Similarly, he also uttered that health and better living are the prerequisites for uh, human development and progress. Now, if you uh, take into account the spirit of Pre President Xi Jinping's uh, speech at WOW Forum, uh, you would certainly come to the conclusion that uh, poverty reduction and food security are the main concerns uh, upon which the whole development and even the political stability of a society or a region depends. So I'll be uh, talking in a little detail about poverty reduction and food security concerns because these are the first two uh, these are the first two objectives of both GDI and STD and they both overlap. Since 
the start of COVID-19, the progress on poverty reduction has been almost reversed. Uh, it has gone into a decline, such a decline that we didn't even see since last uh, 1990s Asian financial crisis. Even before COVID-19, the world was not on the track to achieve the United Nations uh, Sustainable Developmental Goals by 2030. And without any immediate and significant action, uh, we are unable, we will be unable to achieve these goals. So uh, in these times, the China's DDI, they, they have come like a blessing, especially upon the global south, upon the underdeveloped and the least developed countries. If you look at this graph, it shows that in 2015, around 741 million people were under the line of poverty. In 2017, globally, 689 people were under the line of poverty. So you see a decline in poverty. In 2019, it came to 645 million people, which is again, a gradual and steady decline. But by the end of 2019 and start of the pandemic, you see a steady, you see a steep uh, incline in uh, poverty. Uh, in 2020, the United Nations Sustainable Developmental Goals report, it was reported that 738 people have, uh, they have actually uh, gone under the poverty line. Pandemic not only did this, but it also magnified the working poverty. In 2010, uh, from 2010 to 2019, around 14% uh, increase in working poverty was observed. However, looking uh, at this situation, uh, you can consider different factors. For example, the lockdowns and the related health measures due to COVID-19 had severely affected the informal economy where most of the working poor, they are employed in the corporate sector or in different sort of industries. By 2020, around 46.9% of the global population was severely affected. And in fact, 49.6% of the population was still uh, not covered by any sort of cash benefit or any sort of uh, medical insurance. And still today in 2022, around 4 billion people are living under the working poverty line and they do not have any sort of social or medical security. Prior to COVID-19, around 650 million people were living under the hunger level. And in post-COVID scenario, the global food security and nutrition uh, situation has further exas um, exacerbated. Uh, two things are here. The first one is, malnutrition, especially in uh, children below the age of five. Uh, most of them, around more than 60% of these children, they are living in the least developed countries. Today, around 230 million children worldwide suffer from malnutrition. The main reasons for malnutrition are the loss of household income, or perhaps the reduction in some cases of the total household income. Secondly, the lack of available and affordable nutritious foods. Thirdly, reduced physical activity due to lockdown and disruptions in essential nutrition services. So at this point here, we need some urgent and shared uh, short-term action so that we can mitigate the situation. And perhaps we need some sort of transformation uh, and overhauling in the food system so that the supply chains they work efficiently and effectively and continuously. If you look at this graph, you can see on the right hand, you can see the proportion of undernourished people around the world. And on the left side, you can see a number of people in millions who are actually living under, um, under the nourish, proper nourishment line. In 2020, you can see around 720 
to 811 million people in the world faced hunger. It is an increase of as many as 161 million from 2019. If you break down this data according to different regions, so um, I can say that in Africa, you can see 21% uh, mm, increase in, in, in people who are living under uh, the hunger line. In Asia, 9%, and in Latin America, 9.1%. Besides the hunger threshold line, the second indicator that we use for measuring food security at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, is the undernourishment uh, threshold. The world undernourishment increased from 8.4% in 2019 to about 9.9% in 2020. And today, more than half of the world's undernourished are found in Asia, which number around 418 million, and more than one third in the Sub-Saharan Africa, which number around 282 million. If you look at the proportion of children under the age of five who are actually uh, affected by um, either hunger threshold or maybe uh, malnutrition and they showed the symptoms of the stunted growth, uh, you can see that Oceania region uh, ranks the first. When I say Oceania, uh, I actually am excluding New Zealand and Australia. So please don't consider New Zealand and Australia in this region. Yeah, they, are, we, they, are, they are put separately. If you consider. Yeah, yeah. In Sub-Saharan Africa, you can see that in 2020, uh, around 32.3 children, percent children, they are undernourished. They have shown the symptoms of stunted growth. And on the third number, you can see Central and South Asia, which should concern uh, we as Pakistanis the most. Uh, it stands at 29.8% of our children being uh, the victims of stunted growth. And that was something our uh, previous Prime Minister Imran Khan was also um, uh, talking about in his every other speech. Now let's talk about women and gender. Uh, women in these regions have, adult women in these regions actually, have mainly showed the symptoms of uh, different sorts of anemia, especially the hemoglobin anemia and vitamins, multivitamins anemia, and which results in many different types of uh, other symptoms and disorders. In Central and South Asia, you see that around 49% uh, of women in 2000 and 47.5% of women in 2019 showed uh, some sort of anemia. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa stands second in 2019 and Oceania this time, uh, when we talk about anemia in women, it comes to number three. So uh, in conclusion, I would just uh, say that China's GDI vision can help achieve- Let me show the, the slide, the, the previous yeah. one. Xi Jinping's GDI vision can help us achieve poverty and food security related uh, sustainable developmental goals by focusing especially on sub-Saharan African region and the South Asian region and uh, with special focus uh, on hunger and nutrition because without, uh, without fulfill fulfilling the food needs, how can we uh, move towards the high ranking needs? Political stability is definitely a sign for none for development, but uh, I think that there should be healthy human beings first uh, who should ensure political stability. And according to the Bao Forum's Xi Jinping's opening ceremony speech, uh, better living and health, they are the prime focus and they should be the prime focus if we are looking at human development. 
So thank you. Any questions are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Now at the end, I would like to request Dr. Ijaz. He would just thank uh, everybody on behalf of uh, Ikra University, on behalf of our center. He would just thank uh, all of you and then we will close uh, this session. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Khalid Akram, for sharing this idea two, two weeks ago to have a uh, you know a co event at Ikra University with, with, in collaboration with, with with China Communication University. So we are thankful to both of you and your institution, as well as Khalid Sab and his organization, uh, to uh, to have successfully uh, you know have this event, and we look forward to ha having more uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, Pakistan and China, we have very strong ties, a very durable relationship. And I think the little bit of events would help even further strengthen bilateral ties in the future as well. So thank you for the audience as well. And, uh, uh, and for, of course, uh, uh, for, for uh, I would even like to thank uh, Mariam that she as a contact person was very much efficient. And we look forward to more collaboration with your yeah. organization. Thank you very much.